Well, good day to you all. Buenos dias, bienvenidos. Uh, my name is William Guerrero, the Vice President of Academic Affairs at Chandler Gilbert Community College. And it is my great privilege to welcome all of you who are participating in this prestigious event, this annual convening, the 13th gathering of Ibero-American writers. And our privilege today in particular is to honor our lost colleague, David Munoz, a longtime faculty member at Chandler Gilbert Community College uh, back to 1994, uh, when he first came to Chandler Gilbert as a part-time faculty and became full-time in, in 1997. So uh, on behalf of President Greg Peterson, uh, who could not join us uh, today, I uh, again welcome you to this event. Uh, we have uh, some of our Chandler Gilbert students here, so welcome to you, a number of our faculty and staff and administration at Chandler Gilbert. I wanted to start uh, this afternoon with some personal recollections of David and the years that I knew him. <clears throat> I came to Chandler Gilbert in January of 2003, and it wasn't long uh, based on my travels around our campus uh, that I would frequently encounter David on the sidewalk. Uh, he was a great sidewalk conversationalist and uh, we would often chat about how his classes were going and how things were going at the college and how his work was going. Uh, he was certainly a very uh, well-prepared and, and well-liked faculty member at Chandler Gilbert, but uh, you're going to learn that he was involved in, in many other aspects of scholarship and teaching as well. Uh, David, uh, as we met on those sidewalk conversations over the years, um, has, uh, if I can use this phrase uh, affectionately as, as two old guys, uh, we would uh, notice the, the speed with which we were walking as the years went on. And I would notice uh, David uh, sometimes pausing as we approached uh, flights of stairs, which there are several at Chandler Gilbert Community College. And we used to talk about uh, what was what was going on with his knees and my knees and, and how long it was going to take us to get up the stairs. So those are some great and some fun conversations. Um, as I said, uh, David was, was a very impressive scholar, very impressive uh, teacher and author. He had the, the uh, notoriety at Chandler Gilbert as being an, an early adopter and a pioneer of online learning. And as uh, many of us came into the opportunity in the early late 90s and early 2000s uh, to embrace online learning, uh, Dave, David was at the fair, forefront of that. Um, as you also have heard, uh, since this is a 13th gathering, uh, David was very active in, in promoting scholarship and authorship uh, at Chandler Gilbert, bringing in many prestigious and well-known authors uh, over the years, and we certainly appreciated his efforts uh, in those annual types of events. So it's a, certainly a great loss to us as an institution uh, when someone like David leaves us too early uh, it's a great loss, certainly to his family and friends. And we uh, will take a few minutes for some of our colleagues to share some of their acquaintances and, and remembrances of David as well. So to that end, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Chandler Gilbert, uh, Dean of Arts and Sciences, Chris Schnick. Chris. Thank you, Bill. Welcome everybody to this event. I started working uh, with David as a full-time faculty back in 97, and we shared an office. Um, and so we regularly, I would regularly see how much he loved teaching, how enthusiastic he was about teaching philosophy and religious studies by the students that came in. He really believed in the one-on-one -on -one conversations with students. But I also saw right at the start that David was a writer. In that first year, he started a college newsletter called The Athenium. And David would write stories about philosophers or about concepts in philosophy. But more important, he would give an outlet for other faculty to contribute and students to contribute. And perhaps most important, 
he would encourage students to write for this college newsletter. At the outset, David was really gathering a community of writers at Chandler Gilbert. So uh, it was really no surprise to me as his friend to see as he started developing his fiction that he started an organization, Peregrinos Jesus Letras, that was all about basically write. We should write in particular to Cano and Hispanic writers. And David contributed, but more than that, he encouraged others to contribute. I'm sure we'll hear more about that, but it, I can't understate the importance of that and how much admiration I have for him for creating that that uh, network, that for, form, uh, forum for, for writing. Um, and at the same time, because he had lots of time on his hands, I mean, he was only teaching full time at Chandler Gilbert as well as uh, teaching classes at ASU and creating this forum. At the same time, he started this annual event, like the event that we're at. Well, he, he, he had others, you know, he, he was part of a team that de developed it. Um, but he brought, and this is really important to me, he brought, uh, the most amazing writers in the Southwest to us at Chandler Gilbert. So Maria Amparo Escadon, oops. Yeah, that's, I forgot about my background. And Sandra Cisneros, <laughs> he brought, uh, and more, uh, he brought these most amazing writers, Jimmy Santiago Baca, and thousands of students had the opportunity to, you know, hear and see these writers firsthand. And that is so important, you know, that's really inspiring um, and, and, and he also, you know, they got to learn what it meant to be Chicano or Mexican American in, in the United States today, another cultural aspect that was really important to our students. I want to close by saying David inspired me personally. Um, we would always uh, talk uh, in his office or my office uh, pretty regularly, and we would eventually get around to writing. He would tell me which project he was working on. Uh, throughout his, his writing of the different five collections of short stories that he published. Uh, he would give me an update and talk about how that was going. But he always asked me how my writing was going, uh, which is interesting, you know, because I mostly was just journaling, uh, writing personal stories. He always encouraged me to write. And I had a 30-year slowly development of a novel. And he would, he would talk to me about that, but mostly he was saying, write. Chris, you need to write. So here's a person who is a teacher. He's spending his energy uh, gathering other writers, encouraging others to write. And at the same time, he's writing every day. One of the things that inspired me the most was when he was telling me that he would write from 4 to 5 AM every day. Like, that's how he got it done. And I was suddenly like a light switch, like, oh, I have to write if I'm going to be a writer. So he had a lasting impact on me just to develop the habit of writing and writing every day. Well, this, this uh, inspiring man that had at least three professions, writer, promoter of writer, encourager of writer, and teacher, has inspired so many students and members of the Chandler Gilbert community. Uh, we're very fortunate to have worked and learned from him. It's my great pleasure. Well, actually, let me take a moment to explain the format for today. The format is, in a moment, we'll have the, our keynote presenter speaking for about 30 minutes, and then uh, just as David would want, just in that sort of fashion, we'll have questions and answers for about 30 minutes. Um, it always feels good uh, for to turn on your video and ask the question yourself, uh, but you're very welcome to also type any questions you have into the chat. So it's my great pleasure at this point to turn the program over to Maria Munoz, a friend, David's wife, a musician, a promoter of the arts, a teacher, someone who's, who's carrying on David Munoz, uh, David Munoz's legacy. Maria? Maria, I'm so sorry. If you could unmute yourself on the Zoom. Yes, yes. thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Chris. Uh, my husband, David, called Chandler Gilbert Community College his second home. And it was evident receiving the love of all of you after his passing. Uh, thank you, CGCC. He will commute about an hour from Glendale, but he always did it with excitement and anticipation. 
both his colleagues and students brought joy to his life every day. And as an educator myself, I share the same joy. As many of you experienced, Dr. Munoz drove his students beyond limits of deep philosophical thought. He always challenged his students to crave for learning and to strive to be better every day. Still, he was the kind of person who would learn from every human being and will see the value of each individual complex human experience. David's love for writing extended for many years and it was his friend, our speaker for today, Dr. Manuel Murrieta, who helped him grow in the literary realm. My husband, David, saw the need to support immigrant Hispanic writers, creating a literary page called Peregrinos y sus Letras, which now lays in hands of Arizona State University. I want to thank Dr. Daniel Minervi, Dr. Graciela Silva, and Dr. Manuel de Jesus Hernandez for cherishing this project and making it their own. Uh, with this event, we are inaugurating the 13th gathering of Ibero-American writers in the United States. Let me introduce you to Dr. Manuel de Jesus Hernandez. Uh, <laughs> Professor Hernandez, you're on mute. <laughs> I'm mute. Okay. Hey. All right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mireya. And thank you, Chris. Thank you, Bill. Uh, this is, uh, David came to me and he only did a master's, but I think he should receive uh, two PhDs for what he has accomplished. And so, uh, because he asked, he did earn a, a PhD in philosophy and religious studies, no? To qualify wh why he was uh, teaching at Channel Giver Community College, he earned it. But just let me go into, into briefly, just a, Few, a few words, uh, because what we do need to listen is what uh, Manuel Morrieta will say. Uh, welcome to the launching of the 13th Encuentro de Escritores Iberoamericanos de Estados Unidos. That is the 13th gathering of Ibero-American writers in the United States. Based in Chandler Gilbert Community College, this annual event was founded and led by this year's honoree, David Alberto Munoz. At his funding, David made it a collaborative project between Chandler Gilberto Community College and Arizona State University. We in the track Chicana and Chicano Studies in Spanish agreed to do so. And we have been collaborating with CGCC for 12 years. This is the 13th annual event. To honor David Alberto Munoz, we invited his old friend, collaborator, and compadre, the award-winning writer Manuel Morrieta Saldivar. The title of his talk is, quote, the first beer sitting with David that lasted 20 years, full of friendship, writings, and endless trips. It is a rich literary account of David's baptism, work, and success in the world of letters. Hailing from California State University at Stanislaw, and also a graduate of Arizona State University under David William Foster, Dr. Manuel Morrieta Saliva brings, brings great honor to David in the ongoing collaborative relationship between CGCC and ASU. Let us now listen to a profound elegy celebrating David Alberto Munoz. Thank you. Should I start? Okay, I just wanna mention that my relationship with David was more for friendship and literature activity. And that's the core, the center of my, my reading today. And uh, the pictures you have behind me is when I invite David to, for him to be a keynote speaker in our World Language Symposium 2017. And it was the last time we engaged together in an academic and literary activity. And also the picture you have in the posters is when we went together to San Juan, Puerto Rico. Uh, we were drinking for a Puerto Rican cantina. It was around two or three o'clock in the morning. 
we were looking around all over the barrios of San Juan, looking for topics about writing in the future. So these two pictures give you an example about the relationship I had with David Alberto, which is the topic of my reading. Uh, the first beer sitting with David that lasted 20 years. I wanna quote David when we were in San Juan, Puerto Rico. I do get excited. I'm not afraid of any taboo or prohibited subject. I love to see and write about parties, nightclubs, bars, happenings with a happy life and cabaret nights. David Muñoz, San Juan, Puerto Rico, Book Fair 2006. Number one, happy hour, happy hour with David. A man with a tie and a formal suit approached me in the house of the International Language Department at Arizona State University. I speak to him because the formality and seriously projected. And of course, he didn't have to address me either because of my half hippie style, long hair, casual clothing, and cheap jeans. The stranger confessed me that he knew that I was the editor of Culturador, a couple of literary journal numbers that I began to publish in a humble but daring newspaper that was produced in the town of Guadalupe. The director of the newspaper, El Observador, Leonardo Rachel, offered me total freedom in this project that began our work as a cultural journalist in Spanish in the Southwest. So I accepted a variety of voices, genders and styles, the standard Spanish, Spanglish, Mexican slangs, always related to literature. Because this plurality, and despite that image of businessmen or a Protestant pastor, whom I fear because sometimes they want to convert me, I listen to the stranger who revealed his name, David Alberto Muñoz. He was very kind and courteous, like many of his kind from Mexico City. And he did not threaten to read the Bible or invite me to his church. He almost asked permission to speak to me. You are Manuel Murrieta, right? Can we talk? It is about collaborating with your journal. Uncomfortable by his formalism, but at the same time, curious by his proposal, I replied, sure, of course but don't, don't talk to me so formally. David, well informed, did not want to chat in the hallways, but instead, knowing that I organized meetings with other journal contributors in the student bars surrounding the campus, he, he suggested if I could invite him to one of them. Yes, it will be my pleasure, you are welcome. I answered him with surprise because I suppose a gentleman who dressed that way does not drink beer, but red wine or champagne. We agree on happy hour the following Friday at La Tolteca, a taco bar on University Drive. He arrived earlier than me, and after exchanging greetings, to my surprise and with insistent kindness, he asked me what I was going to drink. A mug of beer, the dark one, I said, my usual drink. He went to the counter and when he returned, not only had he paid the bill, but he was carrying a huge pitcher full of dark beer and two or three mugs. Faced with that scene, I thought, wow, he is like me, a pitcher of beer on a Friday afternoon in the middle of the desert. It, has, it is not something one can turn down. In addition, David was the first one to offer me that, a beer, very different from others who only drink wine, a single glass, and contrary to my Mexican custom of passionate a student Bohemia in my hometown of Hermosillo. Despite his formality and between sips, we connected and agreed on most general things. So one picture follow another one. I do not remember if other follow fellow students join us. The truth is that our conversation was tasty and the happy hour with David, which I thought was going to be ephemeral, threatened to extend for more than 20 years, leaving a trail of friendship, short stories, books, journalism, travel, and pleasure without end. 
the magic of this new friendship allowed that afternoon to turn into a whole night. They closed the student bar and at down, we ended up in an Irish pub in downtown Phoenix. I have found my buddy, my bro, my companion, not only for a beer in the middle of the heat, but for literary and philosophical discussions. He was another immigrant full of nostalgia, like myself, separated from the Mexico left behind, who was now sailing in between and among Anglos, Chicanos, Spanish, and South American students, part of an isolating and demanding academy. Two, the, the origin of his first short story. During that conversation, we agreed that we will deliver his first journal contribution the following week. And when he did so, alcohol free and fully lucid, the literary debates began. Possibly due to his theological education and religious studies, David's the, the first text seems to be somehow doctrinary somewhat promoting a pastoral message without much of the many virtues that literature offers. However, I recognize in the contribution, the use of formal Spanish, a broad vocabulary. I suspected that he, David, would be willing to sacrifice himself in order to write in the Spanish language while living in the land of English only. And that he will continue what our ancestors had been doing for a hundred or a, uh, 150 years ago in Arizona and the Southwest. This was very admirable in David's case, particularly because his postgraduate degrees in philosophy and theology were earned in English, which he mastered perfectly. And English was also his teaching language. He was for sure interested in transmitting his ideas, his feelings, his art in our Spanish language. So I saw potential there in the reading collaboration. For this reason, I explained to him as a, in a literary workshop, look, I believe you have a flair for a writer. Your Spanish is beyond the standard and is even elegant. I am going to suggest to you in simple terms that you don't write as the person named David Munoz. Don't be you who speaks of sins or hells or heavens, or good or evil. Rather, what if you instead create narrators, fictional plots? It doesn't matter if they seem real. Try to unfold yourself, develop protagonists and dialogues, even about religion. Those elements will be the ones that set topics and ideas, not you. Then your text will seem more like a short story and not a doctrinal article. He nodded, not at all uncomfortable, rather understanding my suggestion, and he was willing to experiment. A week later, meeting the deadlines, David gave me an, a new text that was a real revelation. He had given it the title, No nos van a dejar entrar. They will not let us in. And he had created a first person narrator and three characters all teenagers, making them talk regarding a teen adventure involving whether or not to go to a movie theater to see a porno movie. <laughs> Master girl, I exclaimed, we are going to publish it. This text by David took almost an entire page in an issue dated April 1995, becoming thus his first short story published in a small newspaper house in the town of Guadalupe. From that date forward, he never stopped. Month after month, year after year, and decade after decade, publishing short stories and articles first in my publication projects and then in his very own. The happy hours with David became a joyful practice. Sometimes we join other friends or they accompany us on off campus whether they were aspiring writers or not. We got together, not only in the student bars near the university, but in other drinking places around the valley, in houses or apartments, 
always looking for the spicy chicken wings, a chef salad, and a pitcher of dark beer. In these happy hours, we met Carlos Rivera, Saul Cuevas, Julian Vasquez, Roberto Forns, Constantino Lopez, even Maria Dolores Bolivar, and more, all new prominent authors or academics. Out of this ex ecstatic practice, new projects surface involving literature, so, such as poetry readings and short storytelling in Spanish at the student center, or setting books in the hallways of departments of modern languages, events organized by us, the innocent grad students. From these experiences, another acquire off campus, David will develop a new talent that I always admire, like his public relations skills behind organizing notable and significant cultural events. During his first such event, not only I was a witness, but I even helped by driving a taxi. It was the evening when he presented the irreverent cabaret and regal singer, a street adad who came all the way from Mexico City and shook the colleges, universities, and the city of Chandler. Later on, this gift of coordinator, David constantly applied to make a reality the annual gathering of Ibero-American writers in the United States. On the other hand, as a team member or a friend, I took David to gathering and meetings in the great city of Phoenix helping him escape from the academic rigor and the confinement of the classroom. Our Mexican, Chicano, and Latino people, without bringing into the picture other ethnic groups, encouraged us to witness pro-immigrant marches and documented workers offering their labor, meetings with Chicano politicians, social and indigenous leaders, newspaper owners, and even lawyers. We went to baseball games with the Diamondbacks, football tournament of the Mexican national soccer team, box fights, musical concert, and of course, yes, we tour marginal and elegant bars, cheap and luxurious topless bars, Mexican nightclubs like the classic Capri off in Van Buren Street. David was a very good dancer and cumbias and cha-cha-chas. Late at night, we ended up in front of a taco truck or eight tacos de asada in Glendale. Perhaps we had a succulent pozole that is our, uh, our handover with a little cigarette. In closing our celebration, David would say, Muy a gusto, compadre. We showed up the variety, we, uh, I'm sorry, we uh, sold up the variety of life for the city in which for different reasons and, and destinies, we fell into as immigrant, and at the same time, as author who hunted for literal text. These tours allow him to increase his literary production, broaden his readership, get to know better the people around us, and thus arrive at his first battle, battle cry, revealing his personal fascination. David focused his enormous eyes on me and exclaimed, look, Manuel, we are living the complex human experience, the complex human experience. And at the same time, we had under our feet, the Phoenix light as seen from South Mountain. Number three, Calzadas Humanas, his first book on the Mexicalipsis producing emigration. It was urgent for me to graduate and allow myself to be fully absorbed by the distant and immediate, immediate world, not only to know it, but also to write about it and to publish texts widely, abandoning the limit of academy. For this reason, before receiving my doctorate degree, I developed the idea of professional, professionalizing Culturador and founding a publishing house. I had noticed a void in our state. No one in Arizona produced books in Spanish for the general public, nor did Latino cultural journalism exist. I relied on my contact in ASU, the great Phoenix community, those from Sonora, a solid support for my partner and now wife, 
Kathy, and you guess it from David. Aware of my doubts, my idealism, and my dreaming, David encouraged me. I support you, bro. I will not leave you by yourself. We began to publish in project. We, we began the publishing project from my apartment and later from an office located in downtown Phoenix that was facilitated to me by the charismatic lawyer Enrique Medina, now Justice of Peace in the city of Phoenix. The rumor of a new publishing house spread slowly in the Valley of the Sun and quickly in our ASU community. Support for this project came from the later and the first book we published but was by our admired professor Justo Alarcón, and the second one by the eminent Dr. Lupe Cárdenas. Those two books gave us prestige and recognition. They also moved David to present, to present me a manuscript. I have material from my first book. They are short stories. Can you publish it, Manuel? I took a look at them. Two or three texts were familiar to me. He had already read them in public and caused a sensation, such as the popular short story, Shilaki Layala, the story of a student who suffered repression during 1968 in Mexico City. Because of those stories and the literary quality of the rest of the manuscript, I considered worth publishing. When David shared with me the title, Calzadas Humanas, Human Roles, my editor thinking suggested to him that each chapter could be primary title with the word calzada, road, and then added another word concept related to the content of each section. David corrected me and added that it will be better if we use the word esquina, corner, together with calzada, road, for each chapter. Yes, great, we both shouted out. Four sections emerged with this idea, each one composed of three short stories. Reality road cornered with openness. Fantasy road cornered with imagination. A spirit of road cornered with religion. And modernity road cornered with postmodernity. We started the production right away. Floppy disk, computer, art design, securing cover images from an artist in Nogales. As I did with the previous two books, I took the formatted, the formatted book to be printed to in Hermosillo, Mexico, due to low prices there. At the turn of several weeks, I delivered to David his first printed book, the third one from our publishing house, but it was the very first properly literary creation as it is listed number one in the Imagination series. Calzadas Humanas, was published in a key year, 1998, the same of doctoral the, the same of my doctoral graduation, and only one year after having founded Editorial Orbis Press. This book already shows the genesis of David's literary project, with his themes of nostalgia for the Mexican homeland, border crossing, and the cultural shocks experienced in the new Anglo-American society you also find his deep philosophical and existential messages. Obviously excited, David was thus baptized as a Polish writer in the genre that he mastered the most, the short story. David could not have been happier. It is a feeling that I wanted to repeat with him and with other new author who will come later into my office. The sublime and fulfilling dream of publishing a writer's book. I'm not going to share with you here a full anecdote and a corresponding summary on the birth of each book that David published via my publishing house, a total of seven. If I were to do so, this presentation will be endless. Rather, I will select another one that I consider a key text because of the life experiences examined and the literary discussion the book engendered. The celebrated Mexicalipsis Exodo Hacia la Frontera, Mexicalipsis Exodus to the Border, which got me into trouble and from which I learned a lesson. Never organize the presentation of a book 
until it is printed and in your hands. To begin with, the beautiful cover, the work of the artist Follet, should have come out sharper and more colorful than we see it today. This was due to a technical failure. I was notified about by phone, which in turn delayed the printing, also made in Hermosillo. The printers offered me two options. One, to start all over, increasing the delay, or two, to print with the above mentioned defect and comply with the original deadline. At such time, the presentation of Mexicalipsis had already been announced involving extensive promotion and the event had been organized by the Centro Cultural Mexicano to be held in an auditorium in Phoenix. The Centro expected a packet venue. Given this development, I authorized the printing under the risk that the cover will be defective. Yet I also increased the possibility of fulfilling the commitment on time. Two days before the event, miraculously, the printers confirmed to me that the books were already printed. And I immediately traveled to Hermosillo to pick it up the 1,000 copies. On my way back at the Nogales Custom Office, the amount of copies aroused suspicions. The agents were about to prevent me from crossing into Arizona. But I mentioned that the author of the book was Professor David Alberto Munoz, an important academic at Chandler Hebrew Community College, who would use the book as a text for his student and make a donation from the cells to the community. The Halibai convinced the Migra. I drove my car as fast as I could, and I did not stop until I arrived in Phoenix with a faulty cover, but just on time at the Centro. About two hours before the book presentation began, that bad cover was a technical error that only me and David knew about it. Understanding and supporting, he assured me, it doesn't matter, Manuel, don't worry about the cover. I'm just happy you arrived on time. In, and the presentation was a total success, packed with Chicanos and Mexican readers. The next anecdote is more literary. When David handed me the manuscript, I noticed that part of the team deal with the Mexican homeland and he had, that he had recently visited and also with his experiences on this side of the border. The first challenge was to establish coherence and unity in the text, since the manuscript was a mixture of stories, chronicles, and short essays. Talking about the content, David stressed the anguish that he was experiencing from a very polluted, chaotic, and corrupt Mexico, living another economic crisis, and that he had lost much of his personal identification with his former country. All of these things, he explained, provoked the nuclear option, that of, um, that of definitely migrating, that is abandoning a national situation similar to the apocalypse, an option in line with the traditional the theological discourse. Apocalypse, he insisted, let us somehow use this term. We both commented, but the biblical connotation was very strong. We had to make it less explicit, more poetic or literary for enlightening the mind regarding a Mexico in crisis. Then the inspiration came. We wrote some scribbles on a piece of paper, sat at a bar table in front of a beer, and the miracle happened. Combine Mexico with apocalypse, appearing the wonderful title in Spanish, Mexicalipsis. And in order to give the migrant touch to the book, we added the subtitle, Exodus to the Border. Our souls came back into our bodies. We not only achieved the main thing, designing an attractive title, but we also for, for a narrative strategy that gave coherence to the content. We were thus able to use all the manuscript texts, and we did it not eliminating a single one. We were convinced that all the texts were 
woven around a newly created hybrid concept, Mexicalipsis, which captures a chaotic Mexico that produces migration. This book is significant, then because of his theme, not so much because of his genders. It is the vision from an author who lives his native land, but never forgets it. Mexicalipsis, Exo Hacia la Frontera, is the worldview of a human being who temporarily returned to his homeland, but who is already enjoying the benefits of the American society. And in turn, he describes them because he already is living them. Number four, Brotherhood from California and the supposed silence of death. Somehow, a golden age arrived, an economic stability that allowed us better living condition and the promotion of our books. So we started to travel to book fairs, literature meetings, writers' conference, and we accepted the special invitations. The Valley of the Sun was not enough for us. Even after we went to read at Leo Cervantes classes at Maya School, Boot presentation at Mesa College invited by Professor Tony Cárdenas and Julian Vasquez at Phoenix College. We organized Bohemian nights in my downtown office, in a humble Mexican restaurant and in cafes. We even read and sold books at Phoenix Park and Swap Los Perros on Washington Street. During the Latino book fairs at the convention center, it, it was memorable to sell, our, to sell our books to the famous Chicano actor Edward M. Olmos or the Chavo del Ocho himself who congratulated us for writing in Spanish. With those practices and training, we began to travel across the border to offer a speech at the high school in Nogales to promote readings among children in Agua Prieta as invited by the mayor or to participate in the binational literature encounter in San Luis Rio, Colorado, organized by our colleges. We had fully returned into Mexico, our country that we miss so much, where we both exploited with joy, bohemianness, and creativity. In Hermosillo, my irreplaceable city, my motherland, David also found, David also found his paradise especially in the popular literary event called Horas de Junio, Hours of June, where he enjoyed meeting and interaction with my writer and Bohemian friends. He read there with substance, possessed his hands and arms trembling, catching the audience, and later, mission accomplished, we visited the classic Mexican cantinas, popular nightclubs, and ate street food. And one will think that it will end there. No, after we came back to our hotel room around three or four in the morning, David will take out his computer and start writing a new story, perhaps the product of the new inspiration he had acquired. Or he will write a chronicle of, on the event as I myself ask him to write and publish as part of an agreement with our host. David's capacity for concentration and discipline was such that he did not stop until he finished a writing project. He did not leave it for later. When he finished, even with a coffee or a margarita in his system, he will go to sleep like a baby while I was writing from insomnia. We also leave all of the above activities during literary events at San Diego, San Bernardino, Los Angeles, Oxnard, Tijuana, La Paz, etc. They are, they are all unforgettable and great life experiences grounded on a solid formula. Passionate reading in front of the public, night getaways, gastronomic banquet, soft and strong things, and finally, writing activity at the hotel until down. The happy hours afternoon with David were endless, but they suddenly came to an end. I had to move to Northern California after accepting, to my surprise, a seductive position as a professor of Latin American literature at California 
State University Stanislaus. On that memorable, memorable day, we look at each other skeptically and with great sadness, suspecting that nothing will ever be the same again, and we did not accept the parting completely. I can still hear our declaration. Nothing will happen. Things will remain the same. We will visit each other. Don't go, compadre. We'll be in touch. Now what we are going to do, who is going to join me in the literary troubles? Yes, exactly. What are we, what were we going to do? Because I felt the reality and the emptiness of a separation forced upon me and was pressured by the circumstances. I had to try to find another David Munoz in unknown California territories, to find another da David yet not to replace him, to compensate a little for what we had lost, or at least I needed to add a new friend to my human circle. And I look around, I try and I search everywhere, but he never appeared. There was no substitute, there is no one. There will, be never, there will never be any other David Alberto Munoz. Our friendship of more than a decade in Arizona marked a symbiosis. Our friendship had not even been interrupted by life's natural course. Needed daily labor, marriages, births, and the growing up of daughters and sons. In this, David too, took some responsibility. As a pastor and at the right time of my life, he officially celebrated my marriage with my now wife, Kathy. And he was also a godfather to one of my children. Yeah, a real compadre. Luckily for us, as writers, we understood that family commitments can be fulfilled. And at the same time, we can continue friendship gatherings in our respective home. See you at my house, I invite him or he invite me. Then David will arrive with a new short story to read or comment, a snack and a six pack, sometimes accompanied by another member of our writer's circle. Or I did the opposite. I will arrive at his residence with my dark beer. And Mireya already had the snacks on the table, especially during the happy and crowded birthday celebration for David every September. Yet, my move to California changed Six, everything. Five, one. Yet, yet, my move to California changed everything and silent days, then silent weeks, silent months, and finally a silent of years surfaced and remained around me. After one, in a while, we connected via social networks. As a final point, the silence of death arrived. Sorry, the supposed silence of death. Suppose silence, yes, because we both knew long before that day that there were going to be love, voices, friendship murmurs, and our permanent activity of writing in Spanish in this Chicano clan. We knew that nothing would make disappear those sounds and voices. On the contrary, they will grow as different signs pointed them out and there. For example, when David organized in 2008 the first gathering of Ibero-American writers in the United States, I visualized the importance it will mean for our Chicano and Chicana literature as well as for U.S. Latino letters and American writing in general. For this reason, I not only came, came from California, to participate in a special trip for such an event, but I also managed to contribute with funds from my new home university. It was a success, not only for David and for the, for the Phoenix community at large, but also for timing. Years later, Miguel Mendez, the honor patriarch of Chicano literature, will pass away, taking with him the memory of his last tribute in his life was organized by David. And it is still a success. Are we not here in the 13th version of this gathering and giving it new life? Another sign was the creation of the electronic portal Peregrinos y Sus Letras, where David offered me a permanent space 
a project that continues today. It has been vibrating with renewing content and creativity. Another sign was when several times we agreed on the phone to meet together in a conference under the pretext of participating in the readings, both of us knowing that in fact, it was because we wanted to continue our friendship face to face. For example, when we met in San Diego, Tijuana, very happily, just to take the plane together to La Paz, Baja California, and to participate in the festival, Lunas de Octubre, October months. In his chronicles, he wrote about with great detail. On other occasion, we call each other just to plan global projects, and some were carried out, like the one we did in San Juan, Puerto Rico. Others were not achieved because sometimes each one of us, for different reasons, had to travel alone. Yet each had the feeling that we were traveling together, like when he visited Chile and I visited Ecuador. A, a very clear sign that there would not be an obstacle between us was the binational literature encounter at San Luis Rio Colorado, Sonora, Mexico, April 2019. As both of us agreed, I flew to Yuma because David would pick me up there in his car and from there we traveled together. We crossed the border fully of joy as Saul Cue was, was witness until we arrived at the hotel. The organizer, late by Ruben Meneses, who have known us for years, accommodate us in the same room. It was the last time that David and I spent time together, and we both suspected that, as we had the opportunity to talk deeply, and I was aware of his powerful inner energy. We needed to drink beer slowly, and not only threaten it to make the traditional nights rounds. The intense talk prevented us to go in the streets and we stay at the hotel until dawn, reviewing our long and solid friendship. I was aware and shared what I saw in him, who he was, not only in terms of friendship, but also in light of his writing and productivity in the Spanish language. Hey, you are already a legend, David. People not only know what you write, but also about your night partying from which many of your short stories were born. Come on, bro, give me a hug. And we hug very tight. Our eyes lie red and slightly wet, both knowing we were in light of our friendship and also in the field of border and Chicano literature. Somehow we were satisfied with our lives. That final conversation and encounter are still fresh. I will be uncomfortable, disappointed with myself if this last farewell only took place in a cold hotel room and nothing else. Because to me, David deserved more. I have shared with you all memories and several flashbacks for both this lecture and the wish to dismiss, to dismiss a feeling of guilt. Fortunately, I discovered that there is a magnificent act that frames the meaning of my human and artistic relationship with David. Back in May 2017, I organized a literary event for him. He was our key, keynote speaker at our World, World Language Symposium in Cali State, Stanislaus. I convinced my chair and dean to invite David by highlighting his literary work, his achievements as a Chicano author and as a scholar in philosophy and theology. They approved my proposal and a budget for a banquet with hundreds of students attending in a beautiful auditorium and for a worthy honorarium for David. I picked him personally, who else, at the Sacramento airport. I hosted him, I hosted him not in a hotel, but in my house with our children, my wife. He was a family member, a godfather, a carnal, my own blood, my brother. I took him on a tour of my California territories where he had never set a foot. We, talk, we walk in the middle of the neighboring almond trees. I'll show him the extension of my campus, my office, 
and we ate very formally in the most gourmet Mexican restaurant in town. I did everything for him as if I wanted to fit in to fit in two or three days what we had missed since we separated in Arizona in year 2007. His participation was splendid and he felt in his very own environment, reading in front of his favorite genre, his short stories in front of a large audience, especially Latins and Chicano students. He entertained and, and captivated them with, with his character and his call for linguistic resistance and creativity in the Spanish language. In the end, we all surrounded him and he signed his books. He donated others to the library and thus reserved his visit. And of course, during the afternoon, just the two of us, we celebrated the day's success by enjoying a huge pitcher of dark beer in the center of the city of Turlock, the university city, as if we were closing the circle that started 20 years ago in a student bar in Tempe, Arizona. I reflected on that. It was a timely tribute for him that I had invited not only my dear friend, but the most prolific Mexican Chicano storyteller of the last decades who had already left a legacy. I talked to myself that California State University at Stanislaus had paid honor to an author that I witnessed the moment he started to publish, how he had developed and how he had matured to such a level that he could transcend time and space, defeating in this way, death. That is why when Mireya informed me of his physical departure, I took re refuge in myself. I found myself in pain for days and began not only to recall the happy hours with David or close friendship and literary relationship, but also to listen some faint but resounding voices. Driven by their strain, I took advantage to write a poem in which I point out that the sign of death really does not exist because the spirit of David Alberto Munoz continues to make noise inside of me. His words, both in terms of writing and friendship, I listen to him and David continues to tell me about his new story story. Both of us sitting in front of a beer in some remote cantina found in our Mexico that exists in another dimension. In this way, I know that perhaps a friendship like between David and myself linked with literature can very well overcome and defeat death forever. Thank you very much, David. Thank you very much, Mireya and Mirita. Thank you very much, Dr. Manuel Hernandez, Daniel Vargas, Graciela Silva, to Chandler Hebrew Community College. Many thanks, all of you. Thank you.